Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, welcome to another video. If you're new here, I'm Jackie and I'm a self-taught software engineer with a background in mechanical and aerospace engineering. And in this video, we're going to code up the tic-tac-toe game. You guys seem to really enjoy the code with me videos. The last one I did was to code up a python snake game. Based on the bit of research that I did, I think the tic-tac-toe game is easier than the snake game, but let's see how it goes. So first of all, we're going to code up this game in Python. And secondly, we're going to use Pygame. Pygame is a library which is really useful to code games in Python. I'm going to create a main file named py. If we look for Pygame documentation, we will see that there's this example on the web page. And I'm going to use it so we can start the game and create an empty screen. OK, let's see what this looks like. I'm sure everyone knows tic-tac-toe, but just as a recap, the simple version of tic-tac-toe is played on a grid, which is three by three. I think it's going to be relatively simple to implement this, but we need to take a few things into consideration. First of all, we need to start by building our grid, and we need to have a, se a clear separation of the line so we know where the user has to click. Then we need to have our icons, the knot, and the circle. We need to have some sort of logic which reads in the mouse clicks and translates that into rendering our icons on the screen. Then we need to have some logic to check for victory. We need to check whether there are three consecutive slots which have the same symbol. Since our board game is a three by three grid, I think the best data structure to represent it in the code is a matrix. We will have two players, player zero and player one, or player one and player two. And then as the game proceeds, I will fill out the matrix with zeros and ones according to where the player placed their icons. The logic to check for a win is to check the matrix at every turn and see whether there's a row, a column, or a diagonal which is filled out with the same icon. So let's go ahead and code that up. Before we continue with the game, I just want to give a big shout out to Riverside FM for sponsoring this video. Riverside FM is a platform to record and edit videos and podcasts. Companies such as Spotify, Google, Marvel, and Microsoft use Riverside FM. And it is also the chosen recording platform for some of the biggest podcasts in the world, such as, for example, The Tim Ferriss Show. What sets Riverside FM apart is that it allows you to record yourself and your video guests locally on your own hardware, and this eliminates concerns about poor internet connection. The audio and the video quality will reach studio-level standards, which is really a game-changer. The platform will automatically transcribe and caption your content using AI, and it supports over 100 languages, which means that everyone can enjoy your content no matter where they are in the world. Once you record a podcast or a video, you probably want to edit it, and the post-production process is super powerful but also very user-friendly, and I'm going to show you guys how. You can add your logo, you can change the background, pick your video layout and export your content super easily. They have recently introduced a new editor with cool features that elevate your editing experience. For example, transcripts and timestamps are now color coded by guest. And this provides a really clear indication of who's speaking at specific points in your timeline. In addition, the editor allows you to effortlessly aggregate your content into chapters, making it easy to rearrange them according to your preferences. Quite honestly, Riverside FM is like having a professional recording and editing studio right there at your fingertips. I think that my personal favorite feature of the platform is that you can transform long form videos into short form content. Basically, it uses an AI to identify the key moments in your long video and then it cuts these out and it creates snippets of your video, which are very short in duration. This is really good if you film YouTube videos and you want to, for example, make YouTube shorts out of them which is exactly how I started using it myself. And the best part is that you can use this on content which you upload to Riverside. You don't really need to record on Riverside to be able to use these features. Yeah! The software also allows you to export your video with a higher resolution than the tracks were filmed on. And it does this by applying sort of a resolution booster on top of it. And that's really cool because in the end, you want to get the most resolution and the best quality out of it that you can. If you work with video and audio editing, whether it's for a hobby like me or if it's for your job, I can definitely recommend Riverside FM. I think you'll be as impressed as I am. So thank you again to Riverside FM for sponsoring this portion of the video, and I will leave a link in the description so you guys can check them out. Let's start by finding the grid and the icons. In my opinion, the easiest way to do this is to find an image and then load this image into our game. So that's what I'm gonna do. Maybe this, this looks good. I'll create a folder. We have a cross and we have a knot. I'm going to create a function that reads in the icons in the grid and then plots them on the screen. Load icons. Let's see. Mm. 
actually, I'm going to make it a, a, a generic function so I can like import different icons. How? We could technically just return the icon in this function, but I actually want the icon to be a certain size on the screen. I'm going to have to resize it based on the resolution that I want. If it's the grid, we want the resolution to be the entire width and height of our screen. If it's the icon, we actually want it to be just one third of that in this case, because we have a three by three grid. Resolution. I'm going to pass in the resolution as an input as well. So the path to my grid is icons slash grid. And I want the resolution to be the window width. I want it to scale to that size. And then I want to add this into my screen. Okay, I'm going to pass in a tuple with 0, 0, which is uh, the top left corner of our screen. And we have another bug. Oh, got it. The resolution has to be... I'm so stupid. <laughs> We're in a 2D field. I need to pass in the resolution with two parameters, obviously. Window width. Okay, let's see if this works now. Oh, wow. Actually, maybe we should make this a white background. White. Okay, I like this. Now we can create the other two marks as well. So, let's put the boxes. So I'm going to pass in the resolution for the icons as a third of the screen resolution. Let's just render them to make sure that they look okay. Icon X, icon O, I'm going to render it. Looks pretty good. I'm going to create the boards. I'm going to fill it up with nonce. Nonce is the equivalent of no and Python. I'm going to create a function which will represent a turn in the game. Play turn. So now we start the logic of the game itself. Here I need to pay attention of the location of the mouse on my grid. And I'm going to turn the location of my mouse into a vector. Get position. But I actually want to scale it down to the size of my screen because I want to know is it in position 0, 1 or 2 because that will align with the indices of my board matrix. So we basically need to normalize this coordinates and we can do that by dividing it by the window width. So this is current coordinates. If the mouse is pressed and this get pressed method actually returns all the, the three main buttons on your mouse and you actually want the left one which is the one which is in the first position so you want to check if the left button of your mouse was pressed and you can do that by getting the index zero of the array which gets returned with this get pressed method if the mouse was pressed we want to turn the null value which is present in our matrix at that specific index into a zero or a one depending on which player is playing i'm not sure what this returns this vector three Oh, it returns a three-dimensional array, but I can use vector two in that case because I'm only working with two dimensions. This should return two numbers already. This is a bit confusing now, but basically our X represents the column we're at and our Y represents the row. So it is the opposite way. Now we need to see who the player is. So I'm actually going to pass in a player here. Current player. That will be an input into my function. It will be zero if current player 
equals zero, otherwise it will be a one. And then we need to flip the player. I'm going to create a global variable, which will be my player. And it starts with zero, which is going to be the first player. Now, basically, we need to do a bit flip. If the previous player was zero, I want it to become one. And if it was one, I want it to become zero. And I think the easiest way to do this is to do one minus player. We need to make sure that at the end of the turn, we flip the player so that we indicate to the game that the next player should play. So if we start with player zero, we play a turn, we check where on the grid the mouse is, and, if, and we check whether the mouse was pressed. If it was, we update all boards with the right number, zero or one, according to who the player is. And then we need to indicate that it's the next player's turn. So we flip the player. I hope that was clear. What's wrong with this? Row column equals map ends current coordinates y current coordinate x. I just noticed I made a mistake. I was trying to normalize the current coordinate using the window width, but actually it should be one square width. Otherwise it will always return zero because it will always detect any mouse click as it clicking on the entire screen. Now we need to render the knots and the crosses. We can basically do this by looping through the matrix, checking for zeros and ones and rendering the icons on those positions. If the boards in position I, J equals zero, we need to render the knots. If the boards in position I, J, oops. Equals one, then we render the cross. So, how do we do this? So, let's <clears throat> Nothing's happening. Oh, I know. Interesting. <laughs> Something's not quite right here. Mm, this is, yeah, the IF. We're having a big bug here. I need to make my code wait until the next player plays before it continues running. I'm gonna add a wait step in here. I play the turn. Okay, this is better. Okay, this is looking really good. Now we need to check for victory. After every turn, we need to loop through the matrix and check whether there are any consecutive icons, either in the rows, the columns, or the diagonals. So let's do that. I'm gonna check whether player one or player two are winning. I'm actually gonna create some variables for them. We have player one equals zero and player two equals one and we start with player one which is zero if is winner let's pass in the boards and player one then i know that the player one won 
So return player one. If is winner holds player two, for example. I mean, I think this could be done better, but whatever. I'm going to create a function which checks the board and sees whether a specific player has won. So the different possibilities are rows, columns, and diagonals. So this function checks for equal elements in a certain list of icons and it compares it to the one that we're looking for, which in our case is the game player. So for every element in our list of elements, and this list of elements will then be a row, a column, or a diagonal. If the element is different from the icon of the game player, then we know that it's not a winning list, so we return false. If we find no differences, then we know that it's a winning list, so we return true. Now let's write this for each row, column, and diagonal. Let's assume we have a method which checks these individually, so... So these are our winning conditions. Now I need to create these functions individually. I'm not gonna, I actually don't need to pass these in because I have access to all of this. Now we need to construct the lists where we want to check if we have all consecutive equal elements. Now the lists for the columns and the diagonals are not as straightforward. We need to build them ourselves. So if we have the matrix, we will want um, the first column, the second, and the third. The first column will have the elements in position 0, 0, 1, 0, and 2, 0. We construct a list of all the elements in the first column of the matrix, and then we do the same for the second column and then for the third column. Okay, I think this makes sense. Now we just need to check the diagonals. So the diagonals will be uh, words in position 0, 0, and then in position 1, 1, and 2, 2. Two zero? No, zero two. I think. I'm a bit confused. Did you want to... No, yes. Okay, I guess now I need to call my function. Check victory to check this after every turn. Actually, maybe we can add a text on the screen that tells us who the winner is. Player one one. And if it was player two, then I'm gonna replace this with two. Does this work? Let's see. I guess not. Somehow it is not detecting the winner, which is weird. Oh, of course. Uh, if I want this in the middle, I need to split it into two. 
And I probably also need to... Hmm. Okay, maybe not. Maybe there's something else wrong. Oh my god, I'm so silly. I forgot to return. I forgot to return whether it was true or false. Okay, nice. Um, maybe it, actually it was too much to the left. Nice, it's working fine now. This is the correct behavior. There are a lot of things we could still do to improve the game, but I will leave that up to you guys. You can clone the code if you want. I'll put it on GitHub and then you can play around with it a bit. Thank you guys so, so much for watching and thank you to Riverside FM for sponsoring a portion of this video. And uh, yeah, this is all I have for you guys for this video. I will see you in my next one. Bye!